Okay, let's open our Bibles to Matthew, the book of Matthew, chapter 4. Matthew, chapter 4. We're going to pick up where we left off last year. Last week, of course, we had a, a good revival service and some special services, so we didn't have Sunday school lesson, um, but we'll pick up where we left off the week prior to that. Matthew, chapter 4. We read verse 2, and when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. 40 is the common number of testing throughout the word of God. Moses fed Jethro's sheep for 40 years before he went to Egypt and started leading two-legged sheep, for Israel, for the next 40 years after that. He spent 40 days up on the mount to receive the commandments of God. Goliath taunted the army of Israel for 40 days in 1 Samuel 17, verse 16, before David uh, came along and took care of business. But here, after 40 days of fasting, uh, there's a great understatement the Lord Jesus was afterward hungered. hungered. Um, verses 3 and 4 is where we will spend today. We won't go any farther than verse 4 today. Uh, I'm not going to apologize for going slowly because you don't want to miss something that might be instructive and helpful, food for thought, thought-provoking. Verses 3 and 4, And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. He says, if thou be, you know, every time Satan speaks in the scripture, he is questioning something. Genesis 3, verse 1, he asks Eve, yea, hath God said ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? He tried to cast doubt on what God had clearly commanded. And then in Job chapter 1 and 2, he's questioning whether Job would uh, turn on God. You take a protection away from him, strike him down, uh, take everything away from him, he'll turn and curse you to your face. And um, I had a lady text me last week asking about that and wondering if Satan has control over um, the, uh, if the issues that men face uh, based on Job. And I said, Job, the book of Job and the story of Job is a great lesson that Satan is only allowed to do what God, or rather Satan can only do what God allows him to do. He allowed him to afflict Job as a way of, uh, to, to test Job's faithfulness to God. He figured uh, he could depend on Job to come through with flying colors. And uh, so Satan was allowed to do only what God permitted in the case of Job. And in Job 1 and Job 2, uh, two places, the Bible says, Thus Job sinned not with his lips, nor charged God foolishly. And in my daily Bible reading, I was just finishing the book of Job the other day, and I was paying very close attention to that after receiving her text. And uh, Job is wondering, he's asking, what have I done? What have I done? What have I done effectively uh, to deserve these problems? But he never once accused God of being unjust or unfair. His friends said, obviously, you've done something wrong. That was their uh, solution. Obviously, you've done something wrong. I mean, why would God afflict somebody who's uh, doing right. God only afflicts those who are in the wrong. At least that was the, their assessment. That's what they assumed. You know, and that's what a lot of modern men think. They think, well, bad things happen to bad people, and good things happen to good people. Yeah, but you can't deny that a lot of mobsters and mafioso lived in nice homes and drove nice cars and had a lot of money, and they weren't up to anything good. <laughs> and there's a lot of gang members and a lot of hip-hop artists who are just one step away from jail as rapists and thugs uh, who are living the, the great life with a lot of cash, a lot of cars, 
a lot of possessions and nice homes, and uh, they've probably got rap sheets that follow them right into the recording studio. And they started recording their their uh, uh, garbage known as music. But uh, so, so it, it's not it's not that cut and dry. In Job 12, Job says, the tabernacles of rob robbers prosper, and they that provoke God are secure. At least that was his assessment of it. Why does it seem the bad people, the wicked people, seem to get away with everything? And yet he was able to testify that he hadn't done anything wrong. As far as he could see and as far as he and his friends knew, he had never afflicted the poor, he had never mistreated the um, the servant, he had never hurt those who were less off, uh, less fortunate than he was. And so he was asking, why is this happening to me? But he never charged God foolishly or uh, accused God of being unfair with him. It was just a great mystery to him. He was begging for some sort of answer. His friends gave answers, but they were bad answers. Job chapter 16, Job says, miserable comforters are ye all. And you have three friends that come to offer their words of help in your time of need, and all they can say is, obviously, obviously you must have done something to bring this on yourself. And then they speculate as to what he might have done, and but never once did Job uh, accuse God of being unjust or unfair with him. He just wanted to know why. And um, so he's a great uh, lesson for a believer to learn from that God should be able to depend on you to be faithful to him, come what may, good times, bad times. But, um, and then here in Matthew 4, uh, verse 3, Satan is uh, questioning again. And there's a conditional if found in the three um, speeches by Satan in this text, in verse 3, and then later in verse 6, and also in verse 9. If thou be the Son of God, do this. If thou be the Son of God, do that, etc. And uh, Satan is the founder of skepticism toward the Word of God. He's the founder of criticism towards the words toward the words of God. He's the founder of negativism toward Jesus Christ. What do you mean Jesus is the only way? How exclusionary is that? What do you mean I have to believe in the Lord Jesus to go to heaven? I'm a pretty good person. So he's the instigator, he's the inspiration for that kind of thinking toward Jesus Christ. The atheist proposition goes like this. You Christians claim to believe in a God who is all-knowing, all-powerful, and all-loving, to which the Christian would say yes. Well, then why is there so much suffering in the world? Why is there visibly, obviously, so much hardship and tragedy and pain and suffering taking place in the world? Nobody can deny it. Whether it's physical pain, uh, financial ruin, Warfare, bloodshed, diseases, dead children, sick children, whole nations uh, uh, afflicted by some disease and so on. Why is that all going on if God is all the things that you claim he is? Maybe your life is good, uh, and maybe there's something, someone else over here is suffering, but God is unaware of it. If he's unaware of it, then he's not all-knowing, is he? And if he knows about it, maybe he can't do anything about it. Maybe he can't fix it. So he's not all-powerful then, is he? Well, if he knows about suffering, and he can do something about it, but chooses not to, then he's not all-loving. See, that proposition is offered in some form or another by just about all atheists, and they think they've got you. And most Christians haven't taken the time to think that through and conceive of the right way to respond. And I mentioned it in our church hour. Men have a free will, and they get themselves into all kinds of trouble. 
you have a free will, and uh, your free will helped you to get a ticket when you were driving one time. Your free will got you into an auto accident. Your free will caused you to get sick. Your free will did a number of things. But not only do you have a free will, the next guy has a free will as well. And his actions may, af may affect you. So a lot of suffering and a lot of tragedy and hardship can be attributed right to men. Either your bad decisions or the next guy's bad decisions, you happen to be in the way. And so you eliminate everything caused by any actions by man. And uh, that doesn't eliminate all suffering, but it sure eliminates a whole lot of it. You could, so you, you start there. That's how you start answering that men have a free will. And uh, a parent could step in and stop their children from hurting themselves. Every time they're about to, they're trying to learn how to ride a bicycle, you don't put the kid on the bike first time the two-wheeler and let them go by themselves. They'll fall off right away. You have to help a little bit along the way. You have training wheels, to take those wheels on, so forth, little by little. But you don't let your child hurt themselves. Um, however, there does come a time when you can't be hovering over and protecting every step of the way. You have to let them go. And... Uh, trusting that they understand what they're doing and what's going to be right and wrong and how it's going to affect them if they make a bad decision. So, so if God were to step in and stop you from making a bad decision every time, right before you're about to hurt yourself or hurt someone else, if God were to step in and keep you from doing it, then you would accuse God of being overbearing. Why doesn't he back off a little bit? How are we going to learn from our uh, learn to grow as a race of men if we don't get to make mistakes and learn from those mistakes from time to time? So they want God to step in and prevent tragedy from happening. But when God backs off and allows tragedy to happen, they're angry because he didn't step in. They see God can't win with some people. There's a little girl in her Sunday school class. Teacher was asking. You know, boys and girls, the Bible says that God cannot lie. The Bible says God can't look upon our sin. Uh, is there anything else you think God can't do? And the little girl said, yes, ma'am. My, my daddy says God can't please everybody either. That's very true. God can't seem to please everybody. And he certainly can't please the agnostic or the skeptic or the atheist who wants to find fault. Uh, all at every turn, which goes back to the thing I've said many times. How do you find fault with someone who you say isn't there? You can't find fault with someone if they don't exist. So if you're going to find fault with God, you are effectively admitting that God must exist. So the atheist doesn't realize he's contradicting himself, but he is. But Satan is the founder of that kind of thinking. Criticism towards God, or skepticism of, I should say, towards God. Um, criticism of the Bible, criticism of Jesus Christ, etc. And he says, command these stones to be made bread, in verse 3. Uh, it's true that Satan knew exactly when to hit the Lord Jesus. After 40 days, he certainly was uh, hungry. But there's much more, and, and unfortunately, most commentaries and most commentators and a lot of preachers, they don't go any farther than that. They, they'll say, Satan certainly knows how to hit you when you're down. He knows how to hit you when you're at your weakest point. He, he attacked the Lord Jesus Christ when he was at a weak point, having eaten nothing for 40 days and 40 nights. He knew how to uh, attack him when his body was weak and famished. And they don't go any farther than that. There's a lot more... Uh, to the temptation offered Christ than simply that devotional lesson. I want you to go back to the book of Deuteronomy chapter 9. Keep your finger here. Deuteronomy chapter 9. Deuteronomy chapter 9. Here Moses is recounting his experience with God as he led the Israelites 
through the wilderness the previous 40 years. Deuteronomy 9, notice what he says in verse 9. When I was gone up into the mount to receive the tables of stone, even the tables of the covenant which the Lord made with you, then I abode in the mount forty days and forty nights. I neither did eat bread nor drink water. Look also at uh, verses 17 and 18. There's the, after he came down the first time when the people were doing the Watusi around the, the golden idol, and he was so disappointed with them and shocked at what they were doing, he smashed all ten, broke all ten commandments at one time. Moses is the only guy that we know who broke all ten commandments at once. He smashed them on the ground. Verses 17 and 18. And I took the two tables and cast them out of my two hands and break them before your eyes. And I fell down before the Lord as at the first. Forty days and forty nights I did neither eat bread nor drink water because of all your sins which ye sinned in doing wickedly in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. And then also look forward there at verses 23 to 25. 23 to 25. Likewise, when the Lord sent you from Kadesh Barnea, saying, Go up and possess the land which I have given you, then ye rebelled against the commandment of the Lord uh, your God, and ye believed him not, nor hearkened to his voice. Ye have been rebellious against the Lord from the day that I knew you. Thus I fell down before the Lord forty days and forty nights, as I fell down at the first, because the Lord had said he would destroy you. So when they got to the edge of Canaan, and the two spies, had, uh, the twelve spies had come in, gone in, and two came back, and said, we can take them. The land is flowing with milk and honey. We can take them. The others said, no, there's a, that land is filled with giants. People tall and walled up. Their cities walled up to heaven. We were as grasshoppers in their sight. And uh, Joshua and um, Caleb came back, and they gave a positive report saying, the people are tall, but the land is exactly what God promised. We can take them. You realize that Israel had been on field maneuvers for some time. There wasn't an army in the world that could have taken the, the Israelites in battle at that time. But they didn't trust God. And so Moses goes to seek God again for another 40 days and 40 nights. Three times Moses fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. And not one time did Satan try to attack him, come at him. And clearly he wasn't stronger at resisting Satan than Christ was. So that's why I say there's more to the temptation offered to Christ than simply 40 days and 40 nights without food. Um, nearly, nearly every false doctrine, every heresy that's... Um, proposed and taught is taking something that's true from the Bible and putting it in the wrong time period. This is why we believe in rightly dividing the word of truth. Compare scripture with scripture and see what applies to you and what might clearly have applied to the Jew in the Old Testament or might apply to someone after the rapture takes place. In the Old Testament, we read about John the Baptist's parents, Luke chapter 1, they were still living in Old Testament times before John the Baptist was born. And the Bible says they were both righteous before God. How? Walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. That's how someone's righteousness was defined, by their degree of obedience to the commandments as, as they had received. But in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast, Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, verse 10 says. So you're not saved by your works, but you're saved to perform good works. Uh, Paul writes in Titus 3, 5, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. And yet in the... So you hear these radio preachers, Calvary Chapel ministers, someone will call in and say, how is someone saved in the tribulation after the rapture takes place? And they'll get the same lame response that um, in the tribulation after the rapture takes place, men will still be saved by trusting 
in the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. By grace are you saved through faith. False. Revelation 12, verse 14. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. Faith and works will be the order of the day in the tribulation. Right now, you're saved by trusting in the work of Christ on your behalf. That's all it takes. Believe it, trusting in Jesus Christ does not constitute work, as a Calvinist would suggest. It constitutes obedience, doing what the Bible tells you to do. If you're incapable of believing because you have no free will, then uh, why would God command over and over and over again to believe? Why would he tell you to do something you're not able to do? If God has to overpower you and save you against your will uh, or damn you without you being able to protest, he makes that decision for you and you have nothing to do with it whatsoever. Why would God command you to do something if you're not able to do it? They'll go to Ephesians 2, verse, verse 1. Paul says, And you, he's writing to the Ephesians, And you hath he quickened, made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins. And they'll say, How can a dead man choose to believe Jesus Christ? It doesn't say you're dead completely. It says you're dead in trespasses and sins, a doctrinal definition. what they'll reason how can a dead man make uh, decisions for good or bad <clears throat> but if you take Calvinists and their argument to ex extreme I thought about this the last time I was reading through the book of Ephesians Paul says and you the Ephesians let me back up we'll start with the premise that God decides who he's going to save and who he's not going to save start with that premise which is Calvinists he decided who he will save and who he would damn. And as history took place over, over eons of time, men had no choice in the matter. If God has chosen you, you are going to heaven. And if God hasn't chosen you, you're going to hell. What an idiotic thing to believe anyway. But, but Paul says in Ephesians 2, verse 1, And you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins. <clears throat> My question is this. How did Paul know that about them? See, if you have no choice in the matter, and you don't ultimately know if you're one of the elect or not, how could Paul say with certainty that God had chosen them? How could, God, how could Paul say God had quickened them? How did he know that? There has to be some point where the decision is made and the faith is exercised in Christ. I'd like to ask a Calvinist, if a man is dead in sins, a trespass in sins, and God has to save him uh, for himself, and ultimately no man knows if he is one of the elect. If you say, I know that I'm one of the, there must be some um, uh, objective standard you use to def decide that. How did Paul know that they had been quickened by God? He told them that they were, but how did he know that? Obviously, their quickening had to have been based on some decision they made at some point in life, some point in time. But... Every false doctrine, every false heresy is something true that's taken out of its proper context and put in a different time period than where it belongs. And uh, that's much the case with Satan uh, tempting Christ to, command, uh, to turn stones into bread. Let me have you go forward to the book of Revelation, chapter 12. Revelation 12. And verse 1 says, There appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. 
That is a picture of the state, or rather, the nation of Israel. That is not a picture of the church. That is not a picture of the Virgin Mary, as she is depicted in Our Lady of Guadalupe uh, paintings on the side of some Mexican's van. Um, <laughs> that is a picture of Israel, Genesis chapter 37. Joseph has a vision. His, uh, he saw a sun and a moon and 12 stars. That was he and his 11 brothers. And the other stars bowed down to him. Look at verses 5 and 6. And she, the woman, brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. Well, that was clear. Acts chapter 1, Christ ascended back to heaven. Verse 6, And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she hath a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and threescore days. Well, that doesn't sound like anything I've ever heard predicted for the Virgin Mary. If the woman's Israel, then Israel is going to be fleeing into the wilderness to be fed. Go back, if you will, to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 20. <clears throat> Ezekiel 20. And begin there at verse 34. <clears throat> Ezekiel 20, begin at verse 34. And I will bring you out from the people and will gather you out of the countries wherein ye are scattered, with a mighty hand and with a stretched out arm and with fury poured out. And I will bring you into the wilderness of the people. There will I plead with you face to face. Notice, like as I pleaded with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt, so will I plead with you, saith the Lord God. And forward to the book of Micah, chapter 7. Both right off the book of Jonah, small little books toward the end of the Old Testament. Micah, chapter 7. And a couple of verses there, verses 14 and 15. Micah 7, verses 14 and 15. Feed thy people with thy rod. The flock of thine heritage, which dwell solitary, excuse me, solitarily in the wood. In the midst of Carmel, let them feed in Bashan and Gilead, as in the days of old. According to the days of the coming out of the land of Egypt, will I show unto him marvelous things. God fed the Jews miraculously as they wandered for 40 years from Egypt until they reached the uh, borders of Canaan. And God anticipates a time when Israel will be fled into the wilderness to escape the pursuit of the Antichrist and the armies under his command to uh, destroy them once and for all. And in the wilderness, God will feed her and her uh, once again miraculously. But um, <clears throat> go back to Exodus. Before we go back to Matthew Four again, Exodus chapter 4, Exodus 4, Exodus 4, verses 21 to 23. Exodus 4, verses 21 to 23. The Lord said unto Moses, When thou goest to return into Egypt, see that thou do all those wonders before Pharaoh which I have put in thine hand, that I will harden his heart, that he shall not let the people go. And thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord, Israel, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. Didn't, doesn't the Bible say in the book of Matthew that um, Joseph knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son? They both share the same title of status. And I say unto thee, let my son go, that he may serve me. And if thou refuse to let him go, behold, I will slay thy son, even thy firstborn. The events in the life of Christ 
picture. They don't perfectly match, but they greatly picture events uh, to the nation of Israel and vice versa. God will feed Israel again in the wilderness during the tribulation and Satan's temptations to Christ uh, try to force that miracle uh, to happen at the wrong time. So there's a lot more you can read uh, into the scripture when you compare scripture with scripture and consider other texts. Here, uh, go back to Matthew 4, verse 4. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Every time Christ answers the devil, in verses 4, and then again in verse 7, and also verse 10, uh, he answers with the proof text approach. How uh, is it answered in the scripture? And that should be the attitude, that should be the approach of every true believer. What does the Bible have to say about this? Does the word of God shed any light on that subject? People, it's amazing the things people will turn to to try to find some answer, try to find light, <clears throat> try to find some wisdom, some direction, some influence for making good decisions and keep from making bad decisions. And yet they don't turn to the word of God. And it's amazing, it's sad to say, so many believers, Christians, they'll listen to something their minister says, they'll read some popular book they bought at a Christian bookstore, they'll turn to any number of things. What do what does the opinion poll say about this issue? What does this magazine say about that issue? What does my favorite television or internet commentator say about it? What does pastor so-and-so at some church on the other side of the world or the other side of the country who I don't know, and I'm only getting a few snippets of his uh, church service, what does he have to say about it? And they'll ask their friends, They'll get on Facebook and ask uh, their so-called friends what they think. Um, they'll get on the telephone or the cell phone. They'll call somebody or they'll text a question and they'll, and they'll based upon the text they receive, that'll be the answer. Uh, what does somebody say? What does my political party think? What does uh, anyone happen to think about some issue? Rather than going to the Bible and seeing if there's any light from the scriptures on that particular subject. The Bible says, the entrance of thy words giveth light. It giveth understanding unto the simple. The entrance of the words. So God doesn't promise that you're going to uh, understand all of the Bible and know everything God knows, but the more you expose yourself and your mind to the word of God, the more and more you start to approach problems the way God would approach them. You'd see things the way Christ would see them. Don't always jump at the first thing that's offered to you and tempt it, to tempt you, because it may be uh, Satan. It may be uh, some test. God wants to see if you can pass it. Think about God allowing Satan to plague Job and afflict him, wipe out his children, wipe out his servants, all of his possessions, his flocks and herds, and then strict, uh, strike him down with boils from head to toe, and then three miserable friends that come along and try to say, must have, you brought, must have brought it on yourself. And yet God says, uh, thus Job sinned not with his lips, nor charged God foolishly. I want to be that kind of Christian. Amen. I want to be that kind of saint for God to... Say, God, I don't want hardship. I don't want pain. I don't want trouble and problems. Normal problems seem to be overwhelming at times. So I don't really need any extra ones. But I don't want to ever criticize God or curse God. Job's wife said, Job, uh, Satan told God, you take everything away from him. And he'll curse you to your face. He'll curse God. And then his wife comes along and says, uh, why dost thou retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. She said exactly what Satan uh, wanted Job to say. 
curse God and die. She was doing Satan's work for him. She was his spokeswoman. And yet God, uh, and yet Job still refused to blame God uh, for all of these things and that God was being unjust or unfair to allow the things that he allowed. Man, most of us would buckle under far, far less. We really would. I can't imagine going through that. One of the greatest stories, uh, accounts, uh, and we believe it's a true account, in the history of the world of somebody who kept his faith in the providence and the goodness of God despite the circumstances that he didn't fully understand without cursing God, without getting angry at God. That's a great lesson, great uh, one we can uh, one we can learn from. But liberals in the world who want to uh, point to the Lord Jesus Christ as our great example, they're the last ones to follow his example when it comes to the scriptures. They're the last ones to follow his example in turning to the scriptures to address sin, to address temptation, to address false doctrines and make sense of them. What does the word of God say? What does the Bible say? Now, that's, it's true that every man has a conscience uh, of right and wrong, good and evil. Romans chapter 1, or, or, or Romans chapter 2, verse 15 tells us. But um, the conscience can't prevent you from doing wrong. It only tells you when you have done wrong. But it can't stop you from doing wrong. And so you, these people who say, let your conscience be your guide, well, you'll be okay. They end up making a mess of things, and they wonder why their lives are in ruins. And until uh, eventually, people who let their conscience be their guide, that's a, a untrustworthy, uh, <laughs> untrustworthy guide. Until until um, their conscience are are said to be seared with a hot iron. First Timothy four verse two. And um, so we're going to see that Satan's temptations to the Lord Jesus all have some, ultimately have some second advent uh, fulfillment. Satan's trying to force things to take place for Christ. The Bible says will happen, but not right then. It's amazing people that think um, if you're a good enough person, you'll get to heaven. If you're a bad enough person, you'll go to hell. You won't make it to heaven. And they want to take Old Testament plan of salvation and say that that's the rule today. Uh, these radio preachers that say, someone will call and ask, how was someone saved in the Old Testament before Christ came? And they have a lame answer. Well, they were saved in the Old Testament, Testament the way we're saved in the New Testament. They were saved by looking forward to the coming of Jesus Christ. Somehow, in anticipation of his death, burial, and resurrection, they were saved on credit, as it were. And you and I are saved by looking back at the cross of Christ. But you can't prove that from the scriptures. Neither can they. And one of these days, I'm going to call one of those shows... And uh, when I ask the question, and they're going to give me that answer, they were saved in the Old Testament looking forward to the coming of Christ. Then I'm going to say, well, can I ask a follow-up question? The Bible says uh, in the mouth of two or three witnesses uh, should every word be established. So can you give me two, or, or better yet, three verses, text from the Old Testament to show that that's how they were saved? they won't be able to find one. Because what they'll do is they'll have to go to the New Testament and read Christ in type after the fact. But I'm not asking about the old time. I'm talking about the time period in which these people supposedly lived and were believing on Christ. Find me some good texts from the Old Testament that prove that. Or any one of you should call. Get on the radio one of these days. You know what I'd love to do? I'd love to write a bunch of sample questions to hook some of these guys, and then one day all of us spend uh, the entire hour of their program calling in their show, 
bing, bing, one right after another, asking questions that, that they can't handle. You know, somebody can call in and ask, um, which is the best Bible translation? Uh, which, where, which translation is the, is the word of God? Um, because I have a, you know, you might have to embellish it a little. I have a friend at work that says uh, the King James Bible is the word of God is is that the best translation and when you get the standard answer well no translation is a perfect word of God but there are some better than others these are can I can I ask a follow-up question <laughs> <laughs> if no translation uh, can be called the perfect preserved word of God then what about the New Testament and they they wrote the New Testament in Greek but they quoted from the Hebrew Old Testament at least 200 times didn't they have to translate when they wrote that? Are, does that mean that at least 200 verses in the New Testament aren't the perfect words of God either? And if they translated the Bible from Hebrew into Greek 200 years before Christ, they call it the Septuagint, well then that would mean the whole Bible that Christ used in his day wasn't inspired by God either, wouldn't it? Take that idea that no translation is inspired. God's inspired number of translations, which we don't have time to get into today. We'll save that for another study.